All right, here's the Ruo Shui um, model 4091C. It's a maximum 100 kilohertz LCR meter. And uh, that means it can measure things associated with inductors, capacitors, and resistors in ways uh, pretty much far beyond what a multimeter can do or even a simple capacitor or inductor tester. Um, Ruo Shui um, is a Chinese term that it's the name of a river. I don't know if that's the annotation or the association thereafter. It could be used for some other purpose. The same product or apparently the same product is made under at least a couple of other brand names that I've seen. One of them was something like Eastern Test or East Test or something along those lines. Um, the coloration can be different. The power button can be round or rectangular. There may or may not be this um, red area around the four main selection buttons. Things like that can be different. Now, um, there are, I think, six different models in this series. This is a chart that the seller of this product, the person or the outfit I bought it from, provided me. Because on Amazon, which is where I bought it, it had five different options. The 4090A, the B, the C, the 4091C for sure, and either the A or the B, I forget which. It didn't have all three of these in the, uh, the 91s. Um, they had the same description for every one of them, so it was hard to tell what the difference was. And so I went through Amazon, and they got a hold of somebody at the seller who sent me this. Um, the real distinguishing feature between them is how many frequencies you can test at. Um, the cheapest model, the 4090A, has 10 different frequencies between 100 hertz and 10 kilohertz. The, the 90B is 100 up through 20K, and the 90C is 100 up through 100K. And then um, the 91A, 91B, 91C have the same frequency range limitations, uh, the A going up to 10 kilohertz, the B going to 20 kilohertz, and the C going up to 100 kilohertz. But as far as steps, they just have you enter the frequency you want instead of pushing a button and stepping through a number of presets. Um, I'd actually ordered a 4090C, which is why this is highlighted, and was surprised that I received a 4091C, and uh, I wasn't sure I wanted that one. Uh, I didn't have a manual that would tell me, and I hated the idea because it says stepping one hertz. I thought, well, I don't want to be stepping one hertz at a time from you know the lowest frequency up to 100 kilohertz. Um, so. I had to go back again through Amazon because I couldn't reach the seller otherwise. And they got somebody there to return my message and explain that no, you can you can do it that way by just incrementing, but the preferred method is to enter it on the keypad. Whichever frequency you want to test at. Uh, the rest of the specs here, assuming these are correct, it's a 3.5 inch diagonal TFT LCD. The uh, main parameter is displayed up to five digits. The auxiliary or secondary parameter is also five digits. Measuring parameters L, C, R, and Z as the primary, and then the auxiliary or secondary is X, D, Q, theta, and ESR. Measuring range 0.01 microhenries to 9999 henries 
0.01 picofarads to 99.999 millifarads and 0.0001 ohms to 99.999 mega ohms. Basic accuracy 0.2%. Measuring speed um, 2 time S slash S. That's samples per second, I guess. That's slow. It can be four times. Oh, I think they put in a space there. So two times per second, four times per second, or eight times per second. Slow, medium, and fast. It can have a bias voltage of 0 to 1500 millivolts. Uh, it's adjustable or stepping in one millivolt uh, increments. Open circuit calibration, short circuit calibration. Um, it has various interfaces like RS-232 or RS-485, USB, <laughs> GPIB, they mix up handle, I don't know what that is. Um, it can measure DCR and electrolytic capacitor, measuring motor available, backlight, Luminance can be adjustable. Chinese or English mode are optional. So, so in addition to the basic meter, the other things that came with this, and I think this is pretty typical regardless of the seller, is they give you two replacement fuses for the power. The IEC style power cord. And one set of test clips. Now because this uses a Kelvin style connection method as you would expect from a better instrument. What they're calling the force and there's uh, the two red ones and the two blue ones and they're color coded with the uh, cables and there are two for example, on the red, there are two BNC plugs and two on the black. Here they're using blue, so there's a bit of a disagreement there. Um, the It doesn't matter which one's the force and which one's the sense, as far as the test clips go. What actually happens there is that it's using the middle connection of both all four of these, and the shield is just there for shielding but the actual signals are only in the middle. Um, so the two force ones, these are the outer ones here, uh, those provide the signal that's being used for testing to both sides of the capacitor, for example, but it doesn't use those same wires to take the readings, so it energizes the device under test with two wires and then does the reading of what it's detecting across the device through the other two wires and that's called a Kelvin connector and it improves um, well it improves the quality of the signal it reduces certain measurement errors or eliminates certain measurement errors having to do with things like the resistance of the wiring and so on so better con better uh, products will have that in some way shape or form while this is not an LCR here it's only an LC a meter and it does not do more advanced things it does do dissipation but it's really just capacitance and inductance even it has uh, Kelvin connectors it's got two places where you can just stick wires in and they go between springy metal plates the two on the top are probably the drive and the two on the bottom are the sensor vice versa so it's using a Kelvin connector. And this is uh, one of my other LCR meters, this X-Tech LCR 200. And supposedly those are Kelvin connectors in there as well. Uh, I'm not sure. When you use the test leads, they're not Kelvin uh, connectors. They're just test leads. So I'm not sure how they're... They can't just be shorting those together, I'm guessing. Or maybe they are. Maybe the the drive and the sense plates are touching each other 
when you don't have a component inserted there and because of that they're shorted together at that point and then they would just have a short jumper going over to the test lead which itself is short thereby minimizing uh, test lead resistance for example but in this case it's being done correctly this is a pretty big meter I was looking around for my tape measure here not finding it I'll just use my ruler so it is um, about nine inches wide on the bezel plus three quarters of an inch on each side for the the handle um, protuberance here and then from the bottom of the feet to the top is roughly roughly four inches tall and then the depth is just about an even foot 12 inches the handle can be removed with some difficulty it's just sprung into the holes and it has these little uh, tabs on there which prevent it from popping out during use and there's a key on the hole where you have to have it lined up with that and essentially you need to have the handle straight up for those keys to align so if you have one of these and are wondering how to get the handle off raise the handle straight up vertically and then just pull out and it's pretty stiff until they come out you may have to wiggle it around a little bit to get the tabs to line up exactly with the keys and then they have these round tabs that stick out and those are the detents they don't require much springing to get them to disengage so that's how that works here's the rear panel the <laughs> the sheet that I was looking at said it had a handle the interface was a handle it's a handler um, I guess that's the top one I didn't see any real documentation on how to do that um, so it seems to have features that are either hardware implemented but not software implemented so why provide instructions or maybe they're buried someplace I didn't see them but I believe the idea here is that you can use this in an automated or semi-automated testing arrangement you know perhaps in a a factory where you're sorting components or something um, and there's some sort of an interface here you can use with a with the equipment that's handling the automation or the process of which this would become part and then it has RS-232 I don't know for what there's USB again I don't know if that just allows you to read what's on the screen remotely or if you can actually control the instrument that way don't know there's the uh, voltage selector switch so that's not a universal power supply even though on here okay yeah AC 200 volts to 240 volts 50 Hertz it makes it sound like that's the only voltage it'll run at um, but there is this uh, 200 40 volt or 220 volt switch and it does have a 100 volt 110 volt position and that's weird because I already powered this up once and it seemed to be working but um, that's kind of weird I had it in the other position I hadn't even noticed what the setting was hmm Well, I'm going to try it in the 110 volt position and see if it works any different from what I did originally. And then you have your IEC power cord socket, and there's uh, the fuses in there. It's the little drawer that pulls out, and it has the fuse in it. And there's even a place for a spare fuse. I think I'll take this opportunity to put one of the spare fuses in there. There we go. It goes in there pretty stiff, but it does go in. I'm assuming that's intended to be a spare fuse holder. That's usually what that, that space is for. 
and you can see the fuse clips are in there. So I want to open this up and see what it looks like inside. I'm guessing I have to take off this rear um, bezel and that appears to have only two screws. Yep, and then that just pops off. And indeed it looks like um, yeah, I still need to undo something to get at the rest of this. No, I was wrong. That's the only thing that keeps the case on is that rear bezel. Once that's removed, the case just slides off. Like that. And look at that transformer. I'm glad I took this apart. This seems to have endured some G-forces. It's uh, really bent up here. Okay, that's better. There's a small circuit board on the rear. It does have a, a couple ICs, or at least one IC. That's down by the RS-232. Yeah, that little IC is surrounded by some small capacitors, and I think what that is, it's one of the uh, several forms of single IC RS-232 um, interface ICs, uh, or interface chips. Uh, those would include a capacitor charge pump circuit to take, for example, a 5 volt logic power supply and convert it into plus or minus voltages since true RS-232 uh, uses different voltages. Um, and then in addition to charge pumping it, the transmit and receive signals at least would go through it and be level shifted to match uh, proper RS-232 electrical protocol. And I'm pretty sure that's what that IC is. Nothing else on there would require very much, I don't think, in the way of interface. Uh, the USB doesn't seem to have a USB support chip, so I'm gathering that gets handled on the main board. Okay, um, it all looks fairly clean in its construction. It has a real power switch in the front and it's mounted with a metal bracket to the plastic front bezel. Then we have the main board, which has quite a few ICs on it. I'm presuming this is the main controller IC. The rest of these look like they're, you know, probably some analog switches, uh, A to D, D to A kind of things. There are what appear to be four spark gaps associated with the four uh, BNC inputs and that would be to protect against extreme over voltage so it doesn't blow up ICs and things unnecessarily although these types of instruments are pretty notorious for being easily damaged if you connect for example a charged capacitor to them and then there's uh, these big things there, which I wouldn't be surprised if they're diodes. They do seem to be arranged in there in, op in pairs and with opposite directions, just based on the markings. So I wouldn't be surprised if those are something similar to uh, reverse parallel connected clamping diodes. Maybe not. Maybe it's something else. This thing may be a reed relay. I'm not sure. It kind of looks like a reed relay. I'm not going to do a Dave Jones on here and pull up all the different IC data sheets. Power supplies on here. There are four ICs on heat sinks. At least some of these are 78 and 79 series linear uh, voltage regulators. I can't get a good look at the other ones. So there's uh, three diode bridges it looks like. Those are the round things on the right and then each one has its own electrolytic filter capacitor. One of them looks like it has a little switching regulator or at least a choke. Um, that's either a small transformer or a choke. Um, let's see what else.
There's the large circuit board on the front, and that's primarily just for all the buttons. But there is an area with uh, some intelligence on it, and I presume mostly that's for the display. And that brown cable coming around would be from the display, plugging into this board. That big black IC is probably the display controller. There are a few chips down there, I'm not sure what they're for. Um, some plugs that are not in use. There's a crystal down there in, in an oblong can. Let's take a look at the bottom. So we can see here that the um, BNC connectors go directly into the circuit board once they uh, exit the rear of the connector. It goes straight in. There's no wiring. There's a little piezo uh, beeper in there. That's that round thing on the black can or plastic can. Um, there's this large lug which apparently is a ground related thing and there is um, a separate ground lug on the front which is not one of the BNC connectors so there's the option for connecting that to ground of whatever you're measuring from and again the power switch there so pretty simple layout um, I've seen somebody else do a teardown on one of these that they complained that the case was needlessly long that it should have been you know this it probably could have been made to fit in something about this big but I'm glad they made it deep um, there can be some reasons for that number one if you're dealing with particularly sensitive electronics sometimes you don't want to have big old power transformers really close to certain parts of the circuitry and this is not like it's a toroidal uh, wound transformer with minimum uh, electromagnetic uh, patterns uh, it's a big old noisy linear power supply type transformer that may be part of the reason and also it's just more stable a lot of these really shallow instruments that are being made today you push a button on it or try to plug something in the connector and the thing just falls over or slides across the workbench falls off the workbench and when you get a bigger one like this with a bigger footprint you can actually push buttons and things without the thing moving around on you and you probably have enough just barely enough there to plug and unplug the BNC's without it moving around very much or even the power switch now this one here granted I don't have it in its case at the moment so I don't have the uh, friction from the rubber feet if there are rubber feet on this I didn't even check no it doesn't actually have rubber feet it's just it sits on the uh, the bumpers on the bezels um, it may be necessary to grab it like this and operate it with the thumb but still I appreciate the extra depth I think it's good and another thing is um, when you've got a bunch of equipment stacked up like this they're all pretty much the same depth it's something of a standard you know the width is approximately the same on all these instruments has been for a long time look at that little Hewlett Packard it's something of a if not a rigidly defined standard it's something that uh, appears to be something that manufacturers have generally agreed on and if you have that form factor then you can stack instruments and if you make this a short little guy then you can no longer do stacking and I should also note that the two screws that are required to get this apart are not threading into plastic they're threading into the sheet metal of the chassis and they're using um, a threaded hole if there's any doubt whether there's uh, shields in these four leads uh, this connector at least has a shield drain wire uh, soldered to the the outside of the BNC connector 
and I assume the others are all the same. All right, let's turn this guy on. I have all the test lead connectors plugged in. Push the power button. Looks like a pretty clear display. Yeah, I'll view it from this angle, less glare. So this is a bunch of settings here. The function is in auto, frequency is set to 1 kilohertz, R out is 100 ohms, level is 1 volt, range is auto, speed is slow, bias is 2 or 0 millivolts, compensation off, list off, whatever that is. This will be your primary parameter, and uh, currently it's set up for resistance parallel and uh, impedance. Let's look at the uh, buttons. So I can change level, that would be this. I can change the frequency, which would be here. I can change the range, and I can change the speed. To go further into it, I would have to use some of the other functions. There's navigation buttons, uh, select and change value, I presume, and escape and enter a set and a shift. I think the shift are used for uh, these buttons that have more than one thing on them. So you can push this button to change uh, auto, R, C, L, and Z. You can compare things, you can do a hold, you can select between X, D, Q, Theta, and ESR. You can do um, tolerance, percent. Uh, there's null, up, I don't know what that means. DCR, save setting, I guess. Maximum, minimum, average. Uh, you can stipulate that you're testing a capacitor. I think this is shorthand for an electrolytic capacitor. I'll verify that, but I think that's what you push if you know you're testing an electrolytic capacitor. It'll change some things. Then auto serial parallel, I'm not sure, and calibrate. This is for the beauty shot. So this is what the test clips look like. They're alligator clips with fairly fine points. You can also use them just as probes to stab into a point on the circuit board. The wires come in one side of the handle, but down in there where you can't see them, one of the wires, you know, for example, the force or drive goes to one of the prongs and then the sense is taken off the other one and they're only connected together when they're pinching a component component lead or when they're just together like that and the same thing for the black one uh... it doesn't matter which side is which unless you're testing electrolytics or some other polarized device in which case the red would be the positive one so just for testing this out um, i'm starting with a randomly selected carbon film resistor from the top of my bench that was just laying there. Uh, it's a gold band so it's 5% tolerance. I would expect it to be pretty close to the right value. My Fluke multimeter said it was 9.81K. On the X-Tech here it's showing me 9.84K so really close. Before proceeding to connect the resistor to the uh, the uh, 4091C here, I'm going to perform the calibration. The wording in the manual is not too good. It does say open the test clamp. Red and black clamps are not connected to any element. So I don't think I actually needed to have those spread apart. I probably messed it up by doing it the way I did it wouldn't be surprised. 
So I'm going to try connecting them shorted together. Well, no. Just this way, the way I'm doing it now. With the tips shorted together, but not the two probes shorted together. So I'm doing it this way and see if it makes any difference. At least something that's apparent. Now I clip them together and push and hold the cowl button. Now it detects that they're shorted, so I just wait for the countdown timer again. So now it's shifted, it's going through different options to see what mode it should be in. Have the resistor connected and immediately jumped to a series resistance measurement, 9.85 kilo ohms. So really close to what the uh, multimeter and the X-Tech said for a resistor. There we've got ESR and it's showing 3.79 ohms. I've got a lot of glare on there. 3.79 ohms. And that's being done at... Um, one kilohertz. So let's see what the the new one does. And um, I'm gonna tell it that it's a an electrolytic capacitor. It's at one kilohertz and it's reading 4.36 microfarads so that's pretty close 4.36 microfarads and I want to get this into ECR reading mode so I'll push this button here to change the secondary parameter and I'm getting uh, 3.84 so really close to what the other meter said and there's a separate button for DCR I push that and it's giving me a DCR of overload or a very high value anyway ECR, ESR should be very low. That's the equivalent series resistance and it should be very low. DCR should be very high. And it is, so it's reading overload essentially. We're a high number. I don't know why it's alternating back and forth. But I think that's just to tell you that it's so high it might as well be an overload as far as the uh, DCR test is concerned. So I'm going to see if I can get out of that, push it again, and I go back to normal display. Okay, I have a 1000 microfarad capacitor connected up. And it's showing me 997 microfarads, so really close to the 1000 that's on the capacitor. And the ESR is showing uh, 0.08 ohms, so I would expect it to be a low value. ESR is often lower on larger value capacitors 
and we're still testing at one kilohertz. Okay, I've got it connected up to the new meter. And it's reading 992 microfarads compared to the 997. And um, I've got to go back and do um, telling it to show me ESR. Oh. Go into capacitor testing mode first, and now it won't test um, the ESR apparently unless you put it in uh, capacitor mode or electrolytic capacitor mode, whatever that is. And it's reading um, 0 0.7 or 0 0.07 ohms, almost the same as the 0 0.08 ohms that I got from the XTEC. So very comparable readings. And the DCR on that capacitor is showing um, a lot higher value than I would have thought. I think I'm going to redo the short circuit test or recalibration. Uh, it wasn't making a very good connection, I think, with the test clips. I momentarily got a lower value when I started messing around with the clips. It went down to something in the ohms. Yeah, the DCR numbers tend to move around a bit. Um, that was my x -Tech meter beeping at me. It was about ready to do an auto power down. Really, anything that's relatively high for an electrolytic DCR is good. Often a minimum value of 25 or 30 ohms is considered acceptable for some of them. Uh, but a high value like this is fine. And because of the way it's doing the readings, it can be a rather unstable reading. And I just wanted to go back and say that the 0.08 ohms for ESR is a very good value, so it's a healthy capacitor. Now I've got a little 0.001 microfarad capacitor on the XTEC. And it's reading 940 picofarads. And the uh, 940 uh, picofarads is the same as 0.000 nine four microfarads which is just a hair under the point zero zero one it should be and I'm going to check the uh, ESR on this using this button here oh come on I think I need to um, put it in capacitance series mode Yeah, the uh, X-Tech was refusing to go into ESR mode because I still had the frequency set to 1 kilohertz, which was too low. Um, so I've got it up to 100 kilohertz now, and it's giving me 23.7 ohms. So now let's check this guy out. Okay, it's given me 937 picofarads. So really close to the 940 the XTEC gave me. And the ESR, um, I need to change the frequency here. So um, pushing frequency. And it's going in 1 kilohertz. So I'm going to try typing in 100 and see if I can get there quicker. Okay, I'm checking the instructions here. Make sure that frequency is selected using the cursor buttons. I've done that. And now if I push the enter button, it's supposed to allow me just to enter the value. 
Okay. So I want to put in one. Nope. Oh, I see. You gotta. You don't use the keypad apparently. I need to um, bump it up like that. So, 100,000 hertz. That's uh, 100 kilohertz. Okay. So now it's 100 kilohertz. So that's how that's done. You adjust it digit by digit. Okay, so um, what was I trying to do here? I was trying to measure ESR. So I go back and push the button to read. There we go. It's reading... Um, oh, it jumped down to... 10 kilohertz for some reason. It didn't stay at 100 kilohertz. That's weird. I wanted to test this at 100, 100 kilohertz. Let's try that again. Enter. Twenty two ohms ESR at 100 kilohertz. That's really close to the 23.7 I got. Alright, so far so good. Okay, I have a uh, 0.1 microfarad uh, polyester or whatever type of cap this is. And it's reading out 101 nanofarads, which is 0.1 microfarads. So the reading is good. And I need to get in here and check my ESR. It's gone back to one kilohertz. Let's see if it'll let me. No, it's not letting me because the frequency's too low, it thinks. 100 kilohertz. So I've put it in 10 kilohertz, and it's reading 1.45 ohms. So let's switch over to this guy. Um, so I'm going to go to 10 kilohertz on this guy. Ten kilohertz, and it's reading 1.38 ohms, which is really close to the 1.45 the X Tech gave me at the same test frequency. So it does seem to be tracking pretty well. The results are pretty consistently reliable. One thing I like about this is it seems to be a little more forgiving on the test frequencies, whereas the X Tech is just a pain in the ass sometimes. It won't let you change into modes, and you're not sure if it's because you violated some parameter in one of the other settings, or if it's just being uncooperative. Sometimes just simply cycling, you know, from capacitance to inductance to reactance and back will suddenly allow you to change into a mode that it, just a moment ago it did not allow you to change to. Well, I'm not going to go into it any further than that at this point in time. It's possible I may decide to do a more detailed video in the future, but I was just trying to make sure this thing was working and that I could do the things I primarily bought it for, which is primarily capacitance testing. Um, I rarely work with inductors and uh, just don't usually have to use them in most of the designs I do or most of the things I'm trying to repair. It mostly comes down to capacitors. Um, so this is now my best capacitor tester. And I'm sure it works just as well for inductances whenever I rarely encounter those. I wouldn't use it for resistances normally because for the most part I'm just going to use my own meter for that. Anyway, I hope that this brief overview was of some use to uh, either people who are trying to figure out how to use this or are thinking about buying one. And another small rearrangement of my electronics workbench. I was trying to get a lot of the test leads out of the way that I don't use, at least for equipment I don't use very often. You know, really the most often things I use are my power supply, so I've always got the cables right here, my primary 
uh, fluke meter just for quick measurements but the uh, the nicer digital multimeter here which I use when I need more accuracy or more resolution and some extra features I've got its leads tucked up along with my tertiary DMM back there also um, I've got my primary tech scope leads tucked up there and my Siglent 4 channel uh, digital scope mix signal are tucked up back there so everything hangs behind the bench it's a lot neater than what I did before where I would just drape all of those around behind this stack and have them hanging down here it wasn't horrible but sometimes they'd get a little tangled up so I think this is a lot better uh, for these I'm using this uh, product called 3M Command damage free hanging holds five pounds well these things don't weigh anywhere near five pounds um, and it has a special system where you can remove them without damaging the paint so you slide the outer clip up off the base which is the part that's actually adhered to the to the wall and then there's a peel strip that you use to kind of peel back the adhesive from the paint presumably it works guys at the hardware store said they've used it successfully so don't know but um, this is what I'm trying out and and here is the new uh, 4091C meter its clips barely make it to the wall <laughs> but they do make it there just keep them out of the way I didn't really want to put it in this stack that was getting to be uh, too much stuff in one stack that's one two three four five six things in a stack whereas this is from the little power supply table one two three four one two three four five six it's also six in the stack up to my little Heathcote amp and a set of speakers 